I'm incredibly pleased that Lawrence um, um, invited me to come and do this. I haven't actually spoken about Freeze Green in um, 20 years. Uh, uh, I'm actually a filmmaker. Um, I'm a writer and director, and my basically what happened to me is I had curiosity about Freeze Green. About 25 years ago, I was living in Bristol. I just wonder, who is this guy? It's in plaques about him. That sort of grew into a sort of obsession, uh, and I should stress this is not so much about, like, was he the first... Uh, I'm just curious to know what he did, but just, like, what did he actually do? Um, and I guess what drew me in was I kind of had this warning at an early stage, which was um, there was this book, and the book had been made into a film, and this was terribly, terribly, terribly bad. <laughs> very, very, very bad thing. <clears throat> but then luckily there was this guy came along, Brian Coe, who on exactly the anniversary, 100, the centenary of Freeze Green's birth, wrote this thing in which he revealed the truth about Freeze Green. And luckily he put it all straight, that he was basically an idiot, he didn't really do anything, you don't have to really pay him any attention, and if, if he did do anything at all, then it was definitely somebody else that gave him the idea, it wasn't him, it was all thanks to other people. Uh, and sort of like, the, like a detective that gets warned off the case, I said, like, okay, there's definitely something here that I'm interested in. So, we've got this. We've got Will Day here. Will Day, absolute super fan of Free Screen. Everything Free Screen does is great. He does actually promote a lot of other early pioneers that have been largely forgotten, but, Will, but you know, it's always Free Screen who's the top man. Um, and then you've got Brian Coe, who's like um, Mr. Very Skeptical. You can't, you can't accept anything that he ever said as being true or anything that you ever heard. And I think both of them got it radically wrong because they didn't really understand the nature of the collaborations that he did and what he was getting out of them and why he was doing them. And when I look back at this article, literally just the last couple of days, after I'd actually decided to do this, I realized, well, this is, of course, what, what Brian Cove did at the very start is he looked at his three key early collaborators and came to drastically wrong conclusions <laughs> due to very limited information. Um, but um, I don't just want to talk about Freeze Green. At, at the end, I also want to talk about what were the other pioneers doing? Edison, um, Donis Thorpe, Laprance, what were they doing in terms of collaboration? And how did they present that collaboration to the outside world? And how was that different from Freeze Green? So let's just roll back 100 years before um, what Brian Coe wrote. Freeze Green's born in Bristol. He's the son of a... Um, of a guy who's a metal worker. His mother is a farmer's daughter. He's the youngest of many siblings. Um, there isn't even that much room in the house for him. Um, he's bright. He gets a scholarship to a little um, sort of private school where he goes for four intense years, from 10 to 14. They actually kick you out on your 14th birthday. Them's the rules. You just go. And uh, he was eventually apprenticed to a photographer, and he seemed to do well at photography, but he didn't do well at being an apprentice to somebody else, and he broke his apprenticeship um, and struck out on his own, uh, and went off to Bath, where he founded his first studio. So at the age when most he would have been expected to be just coming out an apprenticeship, perhaps becoming an assistant, you know, he was already married, he had a daughter, uh, and he was, you know, he had a studio, in fact he moved to his second studio, then he opened another one, and business was blooming. But something else very important happened to him in Bath, and that was this guy, John Arthur Roebuck Rudge, well known, um, <coughs> and indeed, what an intimidating face. Um, <coughs> now, Rudge was an instrument maker, well, that is, scientific instruments. He, in a sense, was... I reckon Freaking could relate to him because Rudge had also come from a, from a humble family. His dad was like a wood turner. Um, he taught himself everything he knew about science and he was very clever with it. He knew a great deal about electricity, was an enormous proponent of the wonders of electricity from a young age and built all sorts of machines, just read about them, built them. Um, and uh, I think Fries Green would have, you know, a slightly older man, would have seen something in him as a bit of a mentor. And above all, he fired Freeze Green's imagination because Freeze Green was a photographer and here was Rudge wanting to do something with photography to create motion with Magic Lantern rather than just using 
drawn pictures or just individual pictures. He wanted to try and create a sequence. And he made this thing called the Biophantic Lantern. So it's got seven pictures around this lamp house, and they kind of go, good chunk, good chunk, good chunk. And this little bladed shutter comes across. So effectively, it kind of blurs the light momentarily, is what it actually does. It doesn't cut it off completely, so the screen doesn't go dark. And they made a sequence together for this. Um, what sequence, I hear you ask? Well, let's have a look at this. Um, and I've never seen this animated before. I thought, well, let's see what it would have been like. I put little white flashes in because I think that's how they would have seen it. <coughs> <laughs> and obviously, people were very struck by this when he first showed it. Um, doesn't seem like much now, but there was almost nothing, there was you know, very little like this going on in the world. And here was Rudd in his little corner in Bath. Um, doing these things with free screen. And when I say with free screen, um, let's have a look at them. This is about 20 years back, I actually was able to handle the original slides, and I was looking at them in the light and noticed this. And if we just kind of flip it over, there's free screen. Uh, so free screen is the body. And, and it's quite funny, to see, because Rudge looks so serious to see the two of them kind of messing about um, behind these slides. But uh, Free Screen had been doing well in Bath, but he felt the draw of London, um, and uh, sort of shuttling back and forth, he began to set up studios there. And as you can see, this is, for, this is for a couple of years later, but he's got a few places in London, he's got somewhere in Brighton, he's got in Bath, actually had a place down in Plymouth as well, um, which is a lot to handle. But actually, he was kind of up there, continuing his education, going and studying, um, and uh, also joining the Photographic Society of Great Britain and beginning to put things into exhibitions like this. This was indeed, actually, this is actually the first exhibition that Free Screen had a photograph exhibited in by the Photographic Society of Great Britain. I just love the way they displayed things. So, who knows, somewhere in that room might be his picture, but he would be exhibited pretty much every year from that point onwards. But he hadn't stopped doing things with Rudge. Um, and they uh, worked together on something else in 1886. This is actually a picture of a carte de visite camera. It's fairly standard. It's like took those little pictures you saw before and take four of them onto one piece of plate. Um, and they created something which was like that, but I'm guessing probably only about literally this kind of size with four, four little lenses on it, from what I can tell from the actual slide. Um, and instead of having just four completely separate pictures, um, Free screen with him tried to create some mini sequences, create some life in the lantern, which is how Rudge liked to refer to it. So, well, what might this have been like? I wondered to myself. Well, I haven't slept that much last night, so I'm just, uh, <laughs> feeling a bit like that. But you know, I'm um, still cheerful despite it all. Um, so this is what roughly people would have seen. It was like a very simple shutter went round and as a light went off from one picture it came onto the next so they just kind of blended. So in a very simple way they're beginning to create motion out of photographs. Um, now um, this is um, free screen from this point on didn't actually really work with Rudge anymore on anything despite whatever you may have read in Brian Coe, there's no evidence whatsoever they collaborated after that last thing that I showed you. But Freeze Green still commissioned things off Rudge um, as somebody who was a good maker and also as a pal. So let me just go here and show you uh, what he was talking about. <coughs> here we go. This, this is him talking in January 1889, in the middle of another talk. So this little incident occurred to me last year. I know a hard-working, clever mechanic at Bath who some time ago suggested this kind of pump. So I said, make me one. Of course, I saw something in his suggestion. I paid him and kept those that were richer waiting. But listen what was the result. He made the pump, got a medal for it at Falmouth, also numerous letters from mining agents, and no doubt it has increased his trade. So this has done him a good turn, and the richer people I kept waiting ought to be very much obliged to me. <laughs> And now I understand he can improve on this one. Um, that, I think, encapsulates uh, Freeze Green's attitude towards collaboration and his attitude to money um, in one paragraph, really. <laughs> it was the attitude to money that was going to get him in trouble within the next uh, year or so. 
but at least Rudge got paid. Um, yeah, this is just because <laughs> I haven't really got anything for this bit, and uh, yeah, it's a dog, so that's nice. Um, uh, during the next couple of years, Freeze Green was working on ways of capturing motion in real time. And I think that's a significant thing. Everything else was posed. He was beginning to look at how do you actually do it in real time, first on glass, and then it appears in some kind of a way on paper film. Um, but clearly, he hit some kind of a wall, and by his own accounts, you know, these things, you know, though pretty hit and miss, the things that he tried out. So he looked for a collaborator. Enter a guy called Mortimer Evans. Um, Mortimer Evans was a civil engineer based in Glasgow, actually, but he came down to London to attend the various learned societies, um, uh, where you know a paper like this, with an exciting title, might be read. Um, in fact, he doesn't even get to read it himself. Lord Rayleigh reads it and said it on his behalf. Uh, but it may well be at somewhere like the British Association, which had, had, a, had their sort of annual do in Bath in 1888, or one of these other places that they met. Mortimer Evans did stuff like construct piers, uh, sort of communication systems in trains, uh, also did work with electricity and light, and Freeze Green had one of the first studios in London lit by electric light, so maybe something to do with that. Who, who knows? Um, certainly not anybody who was involved in any way with photography or optics, either before or after, but a man who knew how to make something. Something like this. A device for taking photographs automatically in a rapid series with a single camera and lens. Quite a significant combination of statements there. So they were creating a camera to, on a roll of film, paper, and then celluloid when they could get their hands on it, um, for, well, taking a rapid series of pictures. And how did this work? Well, um, luckily, thanks to the people at Race to Cinema, who were mad enough to reconstruct this camera, and indeed various others, we can take a bit of a look. Here you go. Not a huge box, it's you know, really less than a foot square as you'll see in a moment when somebody's cranking it. So eminently portable, you can just pick it up and take it with you. It's just operated like that. Uh, at the speed he's cranking it, it's doing about six to seven frames a second is what you're actually looking at in this video. So film is literally, it's going up, it's going over, being exposed, then being taken up underneath. That's uh, the shutter that they devised. So one part's spinning round and other part's going up and down to vary uh, the length of exposure. And uh, not a perfect system, but, you know, seemed to work pretty well. He claimed that it would go up to 10 frames a second, and I don't see why not uh, from what they found when they reconstructed it. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to a number of things that are really significant about this. Um, he was creating a camera which has got a single lens. It's got a strip of film. It is moving intermittently, vertically downwards through a camera, which is a reasonable description of, you know, five, six years down the line of, of what the kind of cameras that were being used in Britain would be like. It also had a like form of a little loop of film that could get pulled down, which was used a lot in projectors and some cameras uh, later on. And also, it's eminently portable, and that cannot be said of, about any of the other early devices. You could pick it up and you could take it somewhere and you could film with it. Um, and that's one of the things, that, as a filmmaker, I find really interesting, the idea that he just wanted to get out there and do stuff with it, not build a studio around it, not have some big palaver. Um, we don't have a lot of images from that. This is something I took in the Cinematheque process when literally we kind of rediscovered this very early piece of film stuck between two pieces of glass with Canada Balsam, I think Will Day said it was. Um, uh, but you can see this is some people walking down by the Serpentine uh, in Hyde Park. It may be some very early stuff he shot. We simply don't... Don't know whether this is some of the first. You can see little pin pricks up the side because it was being kind of moved by pinwheels to hold it in place. So not sprockets, but pins moving it through. Um, and Freeze Green was incredibly excited about 
what all of this would mean. It will be able to investigate all the movements of the spider making its web or a cloud as it forms and thousands of other things too numerous to mention because you can take 600 pictures a minute on one continuous roll of film by merely turning a handle. When I first saw a roll of paper go through at the rate of 10 a second and stop an instant when each exposure was made I felt like a child over new toys. I was as sanguine as possible notwithstanding that there was a slight feeling within me of doubt if it would ever really go on doing it. I think my enthusiasm was more than usual over such things. Mr. Mortimer Evans has improved and improved upon it so much that I am positive the results will have a tendency to bring forward a new kind of photography. In fact, it will make an epoch which will be immensely interesting for the movements of the centipede, the vibrations of the heart will have to submit to its powers of rapid delineation. So, you know, he was very pleased with it and he was very um, thankful to Mortimer Evans for what he'd done in bringing this forward and from the sort of patent stage to the actual stage of making. But in fact, no sooner had he done this, and I mean really no sooner had he done this, um, four weeks after they had the camera in their hands, he actually bought out Mortimer Evans, I mean, paid for his work, gave him 200 pounds, which is uh, probably about 24, 25,000 in today's money. Um, and, uh, but of course, Mortimer Evans' name is still on the patent, and. Uh, there were plenty of patents. There was German ones, and there was a Canadian one, and there was a Swiss one, and there was Australian ones, and there was an Italian one I found, uh, and I think there may be more. Um, and Free Screen actually later sold the patent rights, presumably because he was just desperate for cash and just thought, okay, just, you know, this is what inventors do. You know, you look back, you go, what, what a totally idiotic thing for him to have done, but you. But inventors go, okay, I need some money, now I need to move on to the next thing. I don't want to just stop here. But no sooner had he finished working with Mortimer Evans, I mean, absolutely, you know, we're just talking weeks later when he's working with Frederick Varley, who is another engineer. Um, Varley is, uh, he's done all sorts of stuff, quite a lot of stuff to do with electricity, stuff to do with telegraphy. Um, yeah. Um, he's an electrical and mechanical engineer. Um, I am fascinated to find out more details of a machine he was commissioned to make, which was for weighing mediums, uh, you know, whilst they were, you know, communicating. I, I guess to see how much ectoplasm got released, so it automatically would weigh them to see what the difference was. Um, and he also, he shared interest with Rudge, which was in perform doing performances involving the musical telephone, about which, sadly, we don't have time to talk today. Um, uh, anybody who's a fanatic for the musical telephone, come and see me later. Um, but Varley was a little bit different, um, in the sense that uh, he... I mean, he often presented... They worked on a number of things together, him and Freeze Green, and Varley was often presenting them. And when Freeze Green was not around, Varley was in the habit of just pretending that Freeze Green had nothing to do it, despite his name being on the patent, despite the fact that he was actually paying for the things to be made, despite the fact that he was the person actually using them. Varley would often just totally fail to mention this. But the most important thing that they did together from the point of view of our story was create this camera, a stereoscopic camera. Um, so there you can see quite clearly it takes two pictures side by side they had some notions about projecting but quite how this was going to work well, and they, they discussed various methods of stereoscopy to see things in 3D but they didn't seem to have an actual practical plan um, Varley was very very adamant about how much better his camera was than the one that Free Screen had been working on before but this isn't actually true. It was uh, quite clunky in quite literal kind of clunk, clunk, clunk. Having talked to somebody who's operated a replica, and you can see this is a tiny fragment that's, that that is left of the film. It's probably almost a second between each of those pictures. But I'm told that the stereoscopy is extremely good when you when you do it. Okay. Well, after this, Freeze Green was broke, went completely bankrupt. Uh, was completely ostracised, um, had nothing to do with Varley anymore. But we come across this film here. This film which is never ever mentioned by Brian Coe, even though he must have seen bits of it again and again and again and again uh, when he was researching. It was published, bits of it were published all over the place. And unfortunately, although it is in the archives in Paris, it's virtually never shown. I don't think it's been shown in this country in the last 20 years, or not that I've heard of anyway. 
So I actually reconstructed it out of what I saw when I just took some photographs of the negatives when I first found it. So this is very low quality compared to the actual thing. But just to see what he was actually doing. So it's a very slow frame rate, as are pretty much all of the early attempts. Um, I just want to very quickly, very, very quickly, just look at, look at what other people did with their collaborations. Well, <laughs> they knew their place. Donisthorpe and Le Prince and Edison, and it was at the top. So, you know, you have Edison talking about doing everything and not really giving credit to Dixon, who got quite cheesed off about this in time and wanted to tell everybody, like including Will Day, that he really did it all, and whilst doing that, failed to mention the fact that he couldn't have really done it without Fred Ott and William Heiser, who were absolutely his <laughs> right-hand men. And then we have Le Prince, who came up with a camera, which has now been celebrated in a documentary, the first film. But he, and indeed his family, and indeed even the documentary, not so much, talk about what James Longley did. Um, James Longley was the guy who actually probably did most of the design and making of a single lens camera from, um, from all accounts. He certainly designed a projector for him and redesigned another, which was about the most successful one. Uh, he probably at least should be co-credited as the inventor of that camera, but Le Prince never talked about it, nor did his family, nor do really people now. And Donis Thorpe and Crofts, well, um, <laughs> Donis Thorpe himself said that Crofts knew nothing about uh, photography and optics, which is probably true. But what he doesn't mention is he himself didn't either. He was a guy who spent his time writing tracts about individualism and various other aspects of politics and playing chess. Uh, and he said he left it to Cross because he was busy. Well, I think there is an invisible man here because you don't actually come up with something as clever as that to take pictures like this if that's what you do all day. You only get to come up with things like this if you're somebody that works at it every day of your life, like Robert Paul did. Then you know how to put something like that together. So you've got him working in a nice, friendly way with Rudge. Evans is more or less somebody he's brought on board to solve problems, but still gets full credit for it. Things with Varley don't go so well, and then end up being shoved in a film by mistake um, and uh, coming to represent Freeze Green's first attempts. Whereas I think Freeze Green himself having come from a more humble background, actually regarded his collaborators as being on the same level as him. He didn't look down on them. They weren't his workers. They were on a level with him. And he actually talked about them, and he gave them credit. And this has been perversely turned into, oh, look at him, he didn't really do anything because he worked with other people. Well, you know, they all did. The difference between Freeze Cream and those other people is he talked about who he worked with, and he gave them credit where credit was due. And if you want to know any more, you'll have to go online. Thank you very much. Okay.